Unspoken Issues. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Unspoken Issues podcast. I think we're filling in the third part of our trilogy for Dark Hawk and Sleepwalker. That's right. You, you probably may have gone into the archives and listened to us talk about Dark Hawk. Uh, Chris Armstrong is here to tell us which story that was again. Heart of, what was it called? <laughs> um, Heart of the Hawk. Heart of the Hawk. I about called it Heart of Darkness for some reason. I was like, that is not it. <laughs> Heart of the Hawk. That's right. It was a great, uh, what was that, six issues? Yes. Six issues. Evan Bevins, tell me about the Sleepwalker one we just did. That was uh, Sleepwalker. Color blindness. I mean, this uh, people have been waiting for this to happen. Dark Hawk and Sleepwalker finally are going to be crossing paths in a story called Portals of Power. This happens in Dark Hawk number 19, number 20, and then Sleepwalker number 17. So these uh, these were on the shelves in late 1992. It looks like cover date September of 92. So that's probably about mid to late 92. Uh, to kind of go ahead and throw out our creative team here, which obviously changes as we get into the sleepwalk, uh, Sleepwalker issues, Dark Hawk issues, it looks like it's going to be the same. Danny Fingeroth, writer, Mike Manley, artist, Kevin Tinsley, colors, Bill Oakley on letters. Make sure that that stays the same. Nope. It looks like Dark Hawk 20, Joe <laughs> Rosas fills in as uh, colors on the colorist, as the colorist there for that issue. And then over in Sleepwalker 17, Bob Budiansky, writ, uh, writer, Brett Blevins, pencils, Mike Manley, inker. Ooh, okay. All right. That's interesting. I didn't realize <laughs> Mike Manley, inker, and Rich S. Letterer, Marie and Marie Javins, Javins on colors. So I guess I'll start with you, Chris. This, I know you're picking up Dark Hawk at this point in time, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Are you it, – it's kind of hard for me to justify – when I was a kid, dropping the money on like a second part of a crossover in another title, I was always worried. Like I wouldn't know what in the world was going on over there. Even though it's the third part of a series, uh, you'd think it makes sense. Well, why wouldn't you want to go over there, pick it up? But I was always worried about jumping in the middle of a of a series and and starting to buy an issue that just would not like it would be like an oddball issue that kind of stuck out in my long box for some reason. Mm -hmm. But uh, were you were you concerned about that at all? Uh, it wasn't an issue for me because I was getting Sleepwalker as well. Mm, so, perfect. Uh, yeah, I was on the Sleepwalker from issue one up till probably around this time. I don't think I continued much farther past this. I know this is uh, the Sleepwalker 17 was the last issue that Brett Blevins was the artist on. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember how much farther I kept going with Sleepwalker after that. But I know I didn't continue too much farther. Okay. I think it might have been another one of those situations where, like, the uh, the convenience store that I got most of my comics from stopped carrying it, so I just couldn't get to it. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Evan Bevins, how about you, man? I mean, is this was something that you would have been getting Sleepwalker at the time, yeah. right? I was buying Sleepwalker a little before Darkhawk. I think my first Darkhawk issue was 17. Okay. So, and I I know I started on Sleepwalker regularly a little, like, right before Colorblindness, I think. Yeah, I was uh, I I, w I was getting both of them, but usually usually I followed over into the other uh, crossover book, and and this is this is an era when uh, they did a good job of it of explaining it. Right. Uh, you right. Know, instead of rebooting everything every three issues, and you know <laughs> making sure nobody has to uh, be stressed out by double or heaven forbid triple digits uh, of, <laughs> oh, of yeah. a number, they just uh, made sure to put in the narration and the dialogue what happened, so you knew what was going on. <laughs> and I think you guys had said, and, and Chris, I'll throw it to you here real quick. I mean, this, this has been this was being requested by the fans for these two characters to finally come together and do something for a while, right? Yeah, I was kind of desperate for it at this point, <laughs> and uh, both both of the letters pages for Sleepwalker and Darkhawk were you know littered with requests. You know, most letters pages in the, in those days, a lot of the letters consisted of, "Hey, can." Ghost Rider show up and and team up with Spider Man or you know just always requests for stuff like that and Dark Hawk and Sleepwalker always had um, you know requests for for that team up in each of their letters pages because they were contemporaries you know they both started around the same time you know Dark Hawk a few months before Sleepwalker but they were kind of the new Marvel characters that debuted you know in the early nineties so people wanted to see them you know finally team up or fight or whatever I can't remember if I was 
if if, if I was hoping to to see that crossover, but I I, I do remember the moment when because uh, it was kind of a stealth thing because you do, you don't know um, I don't know maybe it was in an industry magazine or something, but uh, you know you didn't have the internet telling you everything five months before it happened, mm -hmm. and so yeah, I just I, you just flip the page and there's Sleepwalker and you're like, oh man, that's cool. <laughs> so. Uh, now we open this issue with a horrifying grin <laughs> on the face of one member of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, and that is the Toad. And he's trying to get the rest of the Brotherhood, uh, which consists of the Blob, Sauron, Pyro, and Fantasia, to focus as he wants them to work together on a plan to acquire what appears to be something related to Darkhawk, which will help them become more powerful. Meanwhile, a man named... Charles Little Sky, who also goes by the code name of Portal, appears and tries to steal what a what looks like a, a it looks like Darkhawk's helmet, but it's a it's different. It's a different color from a government research facility, but it's having some trouble with the guards. When Chris Powell hears the news of what is going on, he recognizes the person being described as Portal and the fact he had acquired the armor originally from a man he had supposedly killed. Chris transforms into Dark Hawk and heads to the facility. Meanwhile, Peter Parker also becomes aware of the ongoing incident and recognizes running into Portal in the past and aims to intervene to stop the conflict as well. When the government soldiers appear to have Portal captured, the Brotherhood arrives and begins killing guardsmen until Dark Hawk shows up to fight them off. Dark Hawk appears to be having trouble with Sauron. Spider-Man swings in for the save. Portal is finally put on the Dark Hawk looking armor, but the Blob finds him demanding that he actually give him the armor. Portal is able to escape and help Spidey and Dark Hawk deal with the rest of the Brotherhood. Just as the Brotherhood appears to be defeated, the Blob grabs a car. I shouldn't say grabs a car. I should say hops in a car because Blob <laughs> could probably grab a car. <laughs> Blob gets into a car and saves the rest of his team and flees with them. After the battle, Dark Hawk begs Charles to let him find out more about this newly acquired armor. I mean, one of the things we got to remember is that, uh, you know, Chris doesn't know much about this armor that he's wearing of the origin of it uh, at this point in time in Dark Hawk. He has a little bit of an idea, but he's trying to find out as much as he can. So obviously, Charles may hold some keys to some of the knowledge that he seeks. Uh, Portal agrees to do it. However, somebody appears, and that person is Sleepwalker, and he is now demanding the armor be given over to him. So that is our very first issue of Portals of Power, our first part of Portals of Power, The Mutant Agenda. We'll start with, well, the guy that come here to talk about Dark Hawk, and that's Chris Armstrong. Chris Armstrong, Dark Hawk number 19, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, the first thing that uh, you can kind of, you pointed out the grotesque opening page oh. with uh, Toad, and so kind of right off the bat, in the first few pages, we can see <clears throat> Mike Manley, who I like in general, is kind of taking a step back in, in this issue. Like I've seen, I don't know where I, I saw conversations about this, maybe on message boards or maybe like on Twitter years ago, people talking about how Mike Manley was really good early on. And then he started to kind of ape the Rob Liefeld and yep. some of the image guys. You and I think see. this is an issue where you can kind of see what they were talking about a little bit, especially with like, you know, the, the big saliva filled mouths <laughs> with right. these, the, with the bad guys and stuff like that. But, like, I, I actually, you know, we read Heart of the Hawk uh, a few months ago for, for an episode. In between that time, I've read the the issues that kind of bridge the gap between Heart of the Hawk and this, which was uh, a storyline where some terrorists took over Chris Powell's school. Those issues were, like, the art was pretty good in those. It was kind of probably the that and Heart of the Hawk, where those were probably kind of the best uh, of Manley's run on Dark Hawk. This, it seems like it's really rushed. It seems like he's changed his style a lot. It's a lot of cross hatching and shading and stuff. It just doesn't look great. Not bad enough to take me out of it completely because I still, you know, enjoyed this these issues. But but that's the first thing that kind of stuck out to me. <laughs> I took it as the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants just has a really great dental plan. <laughs> Man, I mean, Blob and Toad have extra teeth. I was going yeah. to count the teeth and be like, okay, is this humanly and of course the toad I, I guess we really can't count that as human but i mean i i really was going to count the teeth just to see how many there were and if it was yeah. accurate it's frightening it really is like and sauron yeah, is a pterodactyl man and i don't think pterodactyls have teeth but he's got a lot of teeth <laughs> yeah he's got some sh sharp things hanging down from his mouth that's for sure mutant, uh, mutant pterodactyl man uh, yeah, yeah sure. right 
Uh, what do you think of this portal guy here, Chris? Because, I mean, I don't know. I, I think this might be the first time I've ever read anything with this character in it. Uh, yeah, most of my knowledge of Portal is just from his appearances in Darkhawk. I think he first appeared in an Avengers issue. And as we learned in this storyline, he's got a relation to uh, the character who is uh, Puma, uh, a, a Spider-Man oh, right. villain. I think he appeared in that storyline as well. But yeah, I think he's a mutant who has these ability to open these portals. And so he, I think, appeared in an Avengers issue, like in the late 80s, maybe. And then he showed up again in, in an early Darkhawk issue with pieces of armor that looked like Darkhawks. So Darkhawk thought he knew maybe some of the mysteries about where the armor came from. But it turns out that he just killed somebody that looked like Darkhawk and stole his armor. So that's why he's got uh, those pieces. And he comes back and plays a bigger role in some later issues of the Darkhawk series. Since then, I think he's appeared in the Marvel, some of the Marvel Zombies stuff, though I didn't oh. read the series that he... He's in, like, the Marvel Zombies 3 or 4, maybe both. But okay. I only read the first two uh, Marvel Zombies uh, series, so... Oh, that's um, interesting. But yeah, that's basically... He, I think he's a mutant with, with teleport... With the ability to open portals, kind of like America Chavez, you know, in, in the new, you know, Marvel U. And uh, so, yeah, that's about all I really know about him. All right. I'm looking and just kind of perusing through. I recognize just about everybody on this this uh, Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, except for Fantasia, which it's Fantasia is, with a PH. That's right. Well, it's, th uh, this is sort of the, the early 90s Brotherhood of Evil Mutants roster that I mostly know them from uh, being in X-Force, some of the early Rob Liefeld uh, issues of X-Force. Right. Uh, and it's pretty much the same. I think Fantasia may even be a, a character that that Lightfell created. I don't know because I've only ever seen her in these issues and those X Force issues, but I didn't, you know, look it up, so I'm not certain well, about that. I'll look it up right now. Evan <laughs> Bevins, while, while I'm looking that up, why don't you tell me what you thought of the issue, buddy? Well, um, I, I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. Um, a couple of things that stood out to me, first of all, is what is it about Darkhawk and Darkhawk like armor that makes everybody think it's the answer to all their problems? <laughs> um, I mean, Tombstone's like, you know what I need to beat the hand? Darkhawk's armor. <laughs> and uh right you know brotherhood's like uh you know we need this portal guy and uh you know uh, uh, that, that's just a little uh little natural sarcasm but uh the um no the 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 thing that that really stands out to me um is the sequence where uh where blob commandeers the truck because <laughs> if you look at that before that like they're you know dark hawk's handling himself pretty well and dark hawk portal and spider-man are, are taking down the brotherhood and with the exception of fantasia i mean these are these are veteran supervillains here. I mean, yeah, Spider-Man, of course, has, has been been around for a while. It it almost kind of reverses it because you've got um right before Blob comes in, you got everybody taken down except except Toad, who's outnumbered three to one, and then you have Blob coming in for the last second save and looking rather hilarious in the in his red <laughs> pickup truck as well. But I, I don't know. I just I just thought that was kind of a neat like way to you know, flip the script have have the villains come in with with the last minute save and uh just right. do something a little different right um sorry go i was ahead. gonna say it looks like uh, the blob is driving a go-kart around <laughs> right because <laughs> he's he's so much bigger than the truck rip the roof off of it and just so he could fit into it which is pretty funny like the, the one guy that is not going to fit well behind the wheel he's the one driving the getaway car that's funny yeah, that's good also, stuff. Also, it harkens right back to a time when the Blob was like actually something of a threat and an effective villain instead of the fat guy. Right. <laughs> I mean, he was that too. But uh, but you know, the, like you know, the the Blob wasn't. It's hard to say he wasn't a lightweight, and that wasn't intended to to be a joke. But I mean, he you know he he, he was a decent villain uh, at one point, and now he's the bartender at the Green Lagoon on Krakoa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. By the way, Fantasia. First appeared X Force number six, November of ninety one, created by Rob Liefeld and nice. Fabian Nicieza. So, yep, cash and um, chips. That's right, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> right, keep, keeping a stack of receipts while he's at it. I mean, you get to the end of this issue, and it's their Sleepwalker, and he looks like he is about ready to lay somebody out. So. Tell me, Even Evan Sleepwalker Bevin. suffers from excessive saliva syndrome. Oh, <laughs> yeah, man. It's, it's bad throughout this whole issue. I just saw a picture of Pyro, a panel of just Pyro yelling at uh, Spider-Man and Darkhawk. And uh, I mean, geez, Louise. Anyway. <laughs> and yes, there are some teeth. There are Sauron's teeth. I, I OK. Teeth, teeth, teeth. But hey, <laughs> Sleepwalker has arrived, Evan Bevins, in a Darkhawk issue. 
Okay. I Very mean, cool. It, it, yeah, that's Sleepwalker. What are you thinking, man? Oh, I, I, I was I was really excited. Like I said, I, I I didn't know it was coming. And I'm like, oh, this is great. I always liked uh, having having the comics uh, crossover and stuff. Like I always in, enjoyed finding connections in, in the comics uh, when, when I was younger, and you know, knowing that that this comic I had here referred to the to this one and uh, you know, or or crossed over. So yeah, I I thought that was cool. I also. That that was the first time I'd I'd seen Portal, but uh, I always had a weak spot for alternate versions of characters. So uh, yeah, you know, I prefer Thunderstrike and War Machine to Thor and Iron Man, <laughs> and uh, and so it's like, oh wait, he's Darkhawk, but he's green and he has a gun. I I, I, I can't explain why that's cooler. And maybe it wasn't cooler than Darkhawk, but I, I just I always like you know kind of the the alternate versions of of the mm-hmm. character. I also just thought it was interesting to have, you know, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants taking on a non-X uh, group of heroes, um, right? You know, j- just to to keep it all in the uh, all in in the Marvel universe. So this just this just pushed all the right buttons for me when I was a kid, and and it was a lot of fun to go back and read too. They're they're cashing that. Speaking of cashing checks, let's cash the Spider-Man guest appearance check. <laughs> all right, what are you thinking here of Spider-Man showing up in your boy's book? Uh, yeah, I mean he he has a history with Darkhawk by this point. He he appeared in the second and third issues of Darkhawk, which were you know I started with issue two. So he he also appeared or sorry Darkhawk also appeared in a Spider Man uh, crossover called Round Robin that came out shortly right. after Darkhawk premiered. So they have some history that, together. The sidekicks Revenge was that the that's subject? right. It, I, ne- I never read it, but I remembered that branding. That's going to end up being suggested for a, for an unspoken epic eventually. Because <laughs> it's got Punisher, it's got Darkhawk, Night Thrasher, Moon Knight, all kinds of guest stars, and Mark Bagley's uh, doing the art. It's pretty great. Nice. But um, but yeah, it was cool, and I, I like on page eleven here the first time Spidey shows up. You know, I, I was kind of hard on Manly for this issue, but he's got some really cool panels, and and this. Is a very Eric Larson type Spider Man. He's got swinging through the city in, in the first uh, appearance of Spidey here. Mm. Yeah, that's a great one. Uh, I also wanted to point out the Guardsmen. Uh, it was always cool back then when the Guardsmen would show up, usually just as fodder for the villains to show how tough they are by beating up of the the, the lightweight Iron Man type <laughs> characters. Right. Uh, I've seen these guys before, and I think it was it, it was probably on the front of a Spider Man issue. Mm-hmm. I, I could be wrong, but I remember when I recognize these these are the the green suited guards of this place, right? That's right, what they you're have talking like green. Oh, the vault. That that's that's where they were the guards. Oh, yeah. okay. All right, all right, all right. I know I'd seen them before, um, but yeah, you, just like you said, they are kind of like you know they're heavy hitters, but you know that they're probably not going to make much headway against some super villains <laughs> or you know or superheroes. All right, any other notes? Uh, I think that's it. I, I did have a panel, page 10, panel 3. It's the first time we see Darkhawk uh, taken off from the roof, uh, kind of flying out. So Manly can always be counted on to, to give us a cool Darkhawk, if nothing else. All right, yeah. I, that is that is pretty sweet. I mean, it, he, oh, it's, it's dynamic because he's coming right off of that rooftop, and you can see the wind rushing by him. It's pretty sweet. Uh, Evan Bevins, what's your panel, buddy? Page twenty-five, panel five. Uh, Sauron chomping down on Darkhawk. Uh, the, the the coloring's a little odd for Sauron's mouth. I mean, just I, I don't know. Sauron always it seems like he's become you know kind kind of a joke character these days. Vicious pterodactyl man who can drain people's life force and hypnotize them and hypnotize them. <laughs> yeah, and, right. I mean he, he's he's pretty brutal in in this issue. And uh, I I don't know that that was that was just a cool a cool visual and you know something different than you know just flying and swiping at someone or trading punches or any, anything like that. So uh, that, that was, that was my highlight. You guys must've been like, just taking it easy on me then, because I'm going to take the final page where sleepwalker <laughs> arrive and Spider-Man portal and dark Hawk don't know what to do with themselves. Cause now we've got a large alien that has just showed up that I am sleepwalker. And I swear by the sacred thoughts of the silent ones, uh, that armor shall be mine. Mm. Uh, so I'm taking that one. That's easy. Do you All think, right. in spite of being silent, that they're also deadly? No, oh, they, they could be. <laughs> they could very well be, sir. Silent very but well. deadly ones. Uh, okay. Sorry. Oh, I get it. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I, I'm perfect. Oh, I, I, I don't think not getting it is why Jesse wasn't laughing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. 
Well, then let's go ahead and we'll get into the next issue, which, by the way, this is I, I, I thought this was kind of strange. We got a three issue series. Um, obviously, you know, they, they wrote the story. They put it in the issues that they wanted. But I thought it was strange that we only did. I'm used to doing like one issue in mm-hmm. one title, one issue in the other title. And then we'd finish it up in the other title or, you know, the first title. That's not the way that this worked. We went two issues of Dark Hawk consecutively. And then we're going to finish this up in Sleepwalker, which is interesting. But anyway, Dark Hawk number 20. Here Sleep we go. Sleepwalker was doing his uh, color blindness event. And then, I mean, except for the right. last uh, the last page, Sleepwalker's not not really in it. So, uh you know, maybe, maybe the point was to uh, to surprise everybody, or uh, maybe Budiansky is like, "No, I am not shortening color blindness." <laughs> we've got a message, sir, and we've got to get this out. You All think right. an alien from the Mindscape can overcome a serious light addiction in three <laughs> issues? No, sir. I, I want to stop real quick because I want to. I, I think I screwed something up in the synopsis because, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't read enough Sleepwalker. I thought that where he was when he was in Rick's mind was the mindscape. I didn't uh-huh. realize the mindscape is completely something different. And I learned this just recently. But go ahead. What was you going to say, Evan? No, that that, that that was pretty much it. Yeah, the mindscape was is is the uh, dimension that borders all sentient minds. And I know that just from recently rereading this. Uh, all right. All ago, right. I couldn't have told you that. Well, all <laughs> but right, it sounds good. like I know what I'm talking about, doesn't it? <laughs> Well, I don't, I definitely, sometimes I read things and I'm like, oh, okay, I get that. And I'm completely off. That was one of the things I was completely off about. So that's all right. Well, and you got to be careful in comics where science is always exact and never contradicted by a subsequent writer or the next panel. <laughs> right. All right. Dark Hawk number 20, Portals of Power, our second part here called Sleepwalker's Rage. Portal begins to believe uh, everyone wants him. I, apparently they're just, he's just like, hey, people won't leave me alone. And every time I get uh, involved with one of these guys, it, it, it's just because they want some. And now everybody wants this armor. So he's like, I'm out. And Nobody he transports- wants to hear about Portal's feelings, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. Transports. He transports Charles Little Sky want. Uh, right, exactly. Right, exactly. Nobody's asking that question. So he transports himself away from the trio. Luckily, though, Spider-Man placed the spider tracker on Portal. Those are always handy on Portal before he leaves. Now, tensions flare between Dark Hawk and Sleepwalker, but Spider-Man speaks up and assures them that they need to work together to find Portal. Now, as night falls, Portal appears in the heart of Fireheart Industries, the company belonging to the Puma, a tribesman that Charles Little Sky has known in the past. Finding another tribesman named Running Bear at the building, I think he's like running security or something, Charles learns that Fireheart is not there, so he falls asleep on the couch. But the next morning, Charles is gone with Running Bear dead on the floor and a large gaping hole in the wall to the outside. When Spider-Man, Sleepwalker, and Darkhawk arrive, they believe the Brotherhood may have been there and captured Portal, and they are right. Sauron has Charles hypnotized and looks to have him transport them so that they may steal a large laser cannon that uses a weapon there. But when they do, he takes them to Times Square instead, just as Spider-Man, Darkhawk and Sleepwalker are going by. A battle ensues as Sauron still has control over Portal. He commands them to battle alongside the Brotherhood. As Spider-Man is fighting Toad, Portal opens a rift and Spider-Man gets thrown into it, trapping him in an alternate dimension. Needing to escape, the Brotherhood have Portal open a new gate and they leave. Darkhawk has his hands full, rescuing citizens from a falling billboard, but he is able to look quick enough to see Sleepwalker give chase after, after the Brotherhood through the portal, leaving him alone under the crushing weight of this billboard sign. So that is Dark Hawk number 20. And we're going to start with you again, Chris. Yeah, so with the uh, colorblindness arc right before this, uh, and now this issue, it seems like Sleepwalker has quite a temper. Right. Uh, kind of a jerk. I remember in the last one when we were talking about colorblindness, I was like, yeah, I always thought Sleepwalker was an easygoing dude. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, this sample does not bear that out. <laughs> Maybe he's still suffering, you know, some of the lingering effects. Of that. Right. So I'll, I'll give him a little bit of a break. But yeah, I, I like how, you know, you re- referenced in your panel of the issue last time, Evan, what was Saron clamping down on Darkhawk. And so we see throughout this issue, he's still got the, like the damaged left, you know, shoulder thing. Uh, it's inconsistent. Like it, I, I checked actually in the previous issue, there are some panels where it looks okay, and then there are some where it looks damaged. So it was kind of inconsistent. I did notice that the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, like in their downtime and in their dealing with you know the security guard, 
they really put the evil in Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. They're like super sadistic. They just want to murder people left and right, which I guess makes good villains. <laughs> and then the, the other thing I wanted to to mention was the end when Sleepwalker just like abandons right. Darkhawk, just being a dick again. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so kind of surprising, but it did leave Darkhawk really angry and like. Looking, it kind of leaves you looking forward to when they 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 meet again. Sort of <laughs> like uh, Dark Hawk's not going to be happy about it. And then the 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 only other thing I noticed, I'm trying to find the page now. Sorry, where um, they're having the fight, I guess in Times Square, and there's a theater marquee that for Lethal Weapon Three. Yes, <laughs> which I, I took note of. That was one of the few movies I went to see in the theater. You know, when I was this age. My parents took me to that. And then on the last page where Dark Hawk is like holding up the billboard to his right, I guess left if you're looking at the page, there's like, I guess it's supposed to be like a porn theater smart key. It's oh, it's just no. friends and lovers. And this like got X's <laughs> on the on the top. So it was right next to a Burger King. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Manly might have been sneaking that in past the editor. Who knows? But pretty good issue. A lot of action uh, in both of these first two Dark Hawk issues. I've got to say that while we're on the uh, topic of things that were happening in pop culture or in real life at the time, I shared this on our <laughs> Facebook site. Sauron is lifting a billboard above his head that says Discman, Sony Discman. So I was like, OK, I've never seen a front loading Discman. Mm -hmm. I've seen a top loader all the time. You know, you flip the top, you put the disc in, you put the top back down. But I've never seen a front loader. So I was like... This could be an older model. Well, I looked it up, and I don't think there is a Sony Discman that looks like that, unless it's a yeah. prototype of some way, uh, of some sort. <laughs> I I've, I've never seen one. Well, Jesse, you got to understand this. This is the Marvel universe. This is Earth oh, six one six. It's a, it's a different. You know, in now. a world where Reed Richards creates indestructible fabric out of unstable molecules, you telling me we can't have a front loading Discman? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, so not to correct. spoil. Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, but traffic lights don't even work the same in all dimensions, okay? That's true. Good point. Good you know, I'm kind of surprised they used the actual Sony. Same. Instead of, instead of saying Sony, I, I would have think they would have maybe spelt it S-O-N-E-E -E -E. yeah. <laughs> or something, because I remember right. there's a, uh, I think it's an issue of the Craven the Hunter, Craven's Last Hunt uh, storyline from the 80s, where there's a billboard for Raid, the bug spray, but it mm -hmm. says raid instead of raid. <laughs> so a lot of artists do that kind of like uh, little jokes like that. So right, maybe uh, maybe in exchange for getting the movie rights to Spider Man, Sony uh, allowed them to. I was going to make a movie rights joke too. Dang it! <sighs> uh, too slow, Starcher. I yeah, I know, I know. Um, I I may have missed this, but the Sleepwalker always run around with just one sleeve on and one sleeve off. Uh, it's high fashion in the mindscape. All right, then. Good enough. I, his, yeah. his right arm, I noticed that it, I was like, it looks a different color. Certainly that's just one panel, but it's completely like throughout the whole book. He yeah, has, no, Actually, I do think that's, that's pretty consistent. You know, I don't okay. know if he's like proud of his musculature, but doesn't want to, you know, just rub it in people's faces. So <laughs> he wants people to no, know he's, he's like, strong. I'm not going to go all the way with this. Yeah. <laughs> just a I'm looking at the... Arm. I'm looking at the Sleepwalker cover, and it's the same. Okay. On the enough. cover. Yeah, he, he actually he actually did have uh, uneven sleeves. Um, that was that was, that, that was kind of his thing. Uh, you know, trying to to make a mark on Earth fashion, and um, you know, once once that didn't catch on, that's when he's like, I got to get back to the mindscape. These people. I... Don't me. <laughs> <laughs> he probably uh, couldn't any find other... any jams in his size. You know. Uh, okay. Was he eight, seven feet? Is he seven feet or eight feet? Yeah. He's huge. Seven feet. Pr pretty pretty uh pretty big guy. Pretty big dude. Evan, what'd you think here, man? Yeah, a lot of fun, you know, um, great, great action and, and fighting and um, great action and fighting. That sounded great weird. action um, and fighting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I don't know. It, it, was, it was kind of a cool running battle. And, you know, we, we talked about how, you know, really just Darkhawk, Spider-Man and Portal had the Brotherhood on the ropes. And, you know, then the Brotherhood shows that, that they're not slouches. You know, it's a it's pretty, pretty interesting fight kind of back and forth. Darkhawk kept worrying about the, the innocent bystanders and, um, you know, in the, the storyline between this and Heart of the Hawk, when the, the Russian terrorists 
um, you know, Russian villains. Who who would have thought that? You know, <laughs> nowadays, really weird. They had this scientist that they were trying to capture, and he ended up dying. So that became like you know a, a thing a thing for for Darkhawk, a, a, a running subplot that you know he had tried to intervene and hadn't been able to save somebody. That uh, you know kind of brought back some memories because that was that was the first Darkhawk story I read. So uh, you know it was uh, interesting to, to see that revisited. One thing I, I don't know why I get I get hung up on these these little details, but uh, you know we were talking about you hadn't read about Portal before. This is probably the only place I read about Portal, and I, I, I didn't think you know Portal was that big in the Marvel Universe. But like everybody in this book seems to know Portal. They're, I mean, they're <laughs> right. like, oh yeah, well of course he went to hang out with Thomas Fireheart. They're from the same tribe, you know. Yeah, and then I, I was, last I was issue, the same Darkhawk's way. like, you know, I've read up on you, and it seems like I'm like, you know, in this alternate Marvel Universe with front loading Discman, did they also have fandom and Wikipedia like 20 years early? <laughs> I don't know. Just you know, like Spider Man, everybody's like, well, of course he's going to go see Thomas Fireheart. I, I don't know. I, I, I just thought that was odd. But maybe in that Avengers issue or whatever, he was, uh, you know, he made the front page. I, I don't know. Um, you know, it would be a really like meta thought. Like we have Ohatmu here, a, official handbook of the Marvel Universe. I would just say they have the official handbook of the universe over there. <laughs> <laughs> they well, just pick up issues <laughs> filled with all the superheroes, the supervillains that obviously populate the 616, yeah. and then they could do it. So Not, I'll, not unreasonable. I'll... And, Jesse, to work in my requisite Squirrel Girl reference, uh, we know that Deadpool tried to capitalize on that with his uh, supervillain trading cards. Right. I forgot all about that. Uh, wow. So, uh, yep. Another one that stood out to me. You know, I, I said Sauron kind of gets treated like a joke these days, and uh, he, I think he's most famous— uh, among the general populace, if any of them know who Sauron is, from from the meme that he, he's not actually in, but there was a Spider-Man issue where he teamed up with Stegron. <laughs> and there's the, this meme where Spider-Man's imploring Stegron. He's like, look, you can do all this stuff. You can, you know, you can manipulate human genetics. You could you could be saving lives. You could be curing cancer. And he's like, I don't want to cure cancer. I want to turn people into dinosaurs. <laughs> So and and Sauron has a line that's that's not quite that epic, but um, you know when they're fighting, Sleepwalker says you cannot be allowed to menace the public, Sauron, and he goes, the public menaces me, alien, by their oh, very yes. existence. The public menaces me. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, we make your life so hard, Sauron. <laughs> you fly around in your tattered pants and hypnotize and bite people. Oh. Uh, it's yeah. our fault. We give it him problems. Yeah, we give him problems. There is a, a little bit of an interlude here. And I, I didn't put it in my synopsis, but we got somebody heading to Earth that clearly has. I, well, we'll just say it looks kind of like some Darkhawk armor that they're wearing, mm -hmm. but more um, evil. It'd be cool if you had like a podcast uh, dealing with Darkhawk number twenty-five episode. That you mm, could one of these days, in. I think we'll get to it. Oh, wait a second, uh, maybe we have. Yeah, Check the archives. <laughs> Yeah, th that, that, that's uh, teasing and leading directly into uh, one of the greatest generic titles uh, of a comic book event ever, Return to Forever. <laughs> I can't remember, Chris. Is there a reason they called it that other than it sounds really cool? Uh, if there is, I couldn't decipher it. Okay. Is, there a, is there a place called Forever like that they're actually going to? Isn't there something in Guardians of the Galaxy called Forever? You're, you're thinking nowhere. of nowhere? nowhere? Nowhere, yeah. All right. But, I mean, you know, they they both have letters, so. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Can't you see how I could get confused? I mean, the, uh, there are multiple E's in each word. So That's right. You guys kind of hit the, the high spots for me. Sleepwalker being a jerk, you know, just kind of leaving Darkhawk holding the, say, holding the bag. He's holding the sign, just kind of <laughs> trying to save everybody from certain death. But he's he got to do his own thing. There's a whole um, website dedicated to Superman being a jerk, but that's usually just on the cover. I mean, Sleepwalker <laughs> lives it in the pages. <laughs> that's right. Uh, He's yeah, consistent. Before we get into the pan, uh, uh, the pan, pick the panel. This is of the three issues the most frightening cover of any Dark Hawk <laughs> issue I've ever seen. <laughs> the Blob, who has about nine chins, I swear. I don't know where chin <laughs> ends and chest begins. It's just all this one thing, and then. Yeah, About 64 it, teeth. Yes, man, it's it's horrifying. I don't know, Jesse. I give the edge to that a uh, giant sewer rat in Heart of the Hawk. Mm. <laughs> Look at Blob's nose. Mm. Have you ever seen anybody with their nose in between their eyes? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now, the, the interesting thing about uh, Blob specifically 
is like Rob Liefeld drew him with like this kind of like almost like a cone head shape to his head, except the top is lopped off and, you know, he's got some hair there instead. Right. And I'd say, that's the only time I remember seeing Blob really drawn that way was in X-Force and then in this storyline. So I don't know what the deal is with that. But. Come on, X-Force sold right. like eight bajillion copies, man. Eh, you got, you got to X-Force it up a little bit. It's either Blob uh, or Gideon. <laughs> Gideon. Gideon. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to pick the panel first. So you guys get to wait for me to look through and pick one real quick because I'll keep it easy on you guys. I'm going to go with the point in which Blob has Darkhawk in a bear hug. Mm -hmm. Classic wrestling Blob move where he grabs somebody and is about to try and hug them to death. Well, he doesn't want him to get away. You can't really chase him very easily. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Oh, on a pickup truck anywhere nearby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's kind of uh, kind of in trouble. So, yep, that's the one I will go with. That's uh, that's uh, some classic blob, uh, you know, classic blobs going uh, going on right there. And uh, you know, Chris Powell is not going to be able to escape, or is he? Which is a very, I mean, this is some wrestling going on here, dude. <laughs> does a flip, grabs him by the leg, or grabs his le head by the legs. It's pretty crazy, and then just yeah, ejects his chest beam what is that called again the dark um, force blast dark force blast nails him with it um okay anyway uh this i think i'm just now realizing the dark force blast and the shield are like two different things right oh yeah okay see so, wow there you go the 30 years and i just now <laughs> have turned in my dark hawk fan card i guess <laughs> the, the right energy here. shield is uh usually colored pink yeah um, whereas the Dark Horse Blast is usually colored like a bluish color. Sometimes it, they get them mixed up in the coloring. Yeah. I just thought I just thought he like you know had the force the shield come out and then if he shot it out really fast he could use it as an offensive thing. So man, always learning on unspoken issues. <laughs> All right, Evan, what do you got there, buddy? Let's see. I have. I'm glad you didn't pick this one because I I didn't have any backups for this one. But um, on page eight. Spider-Man breaking up the fight between uh, Darkhawk and Sleepwalker. That's another good uh, dynamic Spider-Man pose there. And, uh, mm -hmm. and Spider-Man's like, hey, guys, we're all on the same side. Uh, right. We just need a plan. Uh, like what? Um, well, uh, hang on. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I like that. You got a, got a good view of Darkhawk and Sleepwalker and a, a nice Spider-Man pose there. Uh, I'm going to go page 18, third panel, which is the... Evil Hawk uh, cameo, sort of. <laughs> but the third panel is when you see the ship kind of coming through with, like, yeah. kind of the light speed going all around on both sides. So I that's almost... Kind of, that's image. Yeah, I really came close to picking something off that page. That ship coming at you looks awesome. Yeah. Good pick, good pick. All right, we are going to head over into Sleepwalker number 17, Portals of Power, part three. When we last left Darkhawk, he's struggling with this billboard. Finally gives it one more, one big giant push and saves the New Yorkers below from being crushed to death. Now Darkhawk aims to try to determine where Portal, Sleepwalker, and the brother, Brotherhood have gone. Meanwhile, at the hideout of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, Sle Sleepwalker appears out of the portal and is able to hide while the Brotherhood plans its next move. But unfortunately, Sleepwalker... I was waiting for this to happen. Sleepwalker's host... Rick Sheridan wakes up, summoning Sleepwalker back into his mind. Later that day, Rick finds a newspaper detailing the events between Spider-Man, Darkhawk, and Sleepwalker and decides he better get to sleep so that he can uh, Sleepwalker can finish what he started. In a different dimension, Spider-Man remains trapped and has garnered the attention of some local residents, uh, put that lightly, who are not treating him too kindly. Uh, so that's kind of where, you know, Spider-Man went through a portal and that's what he's been doing this issue so far. At the radio station WRCK, Chris Powell hears that Sleepwalker has returned above Times Square, so he transforms into Dark Hawk to go confront him. I mean, he's got some unfinished business with Sleepwalker. Once there, Dark Hawk looks to attack him, but Sleepwalker, Sleepwalker explains he knows where Portal is, and they both agree to go fight the Brotherhood and save Portal. Crashing through the Brotherhood's hideout window, the <laughs> that's a classic, unspoken <laughs> issues classic right there. Crashing through the Brotherhood's hideout window, the pair are ready to face anything. A vicious fight ensues, but once again, the Brotherhood looks to retreat via one of Portal's gateways. This time, however, Darkhawk is able to use his cable claw to pull back Portal just before the gate closes. The pair take Portal to Dr. C.W. Fong, 
who is able to reverse the effects of Sauron's hypnotism. Awakening, Portal intends to leave, but out of gratitude will, gr will grant one favor to Sleepwalker. And instead of asking for the return to the Mindscape, which, you know, that's why Portal is so important to Sleepwalker. He, that's, he, that's his way home. But instead of asking him uh, to return him to the Mindscape, Sleepwalker asked, the, asked for Portal to bring back Spider-Man from the Dark Dimension, which I... Did not realize that's where he was stuck until I read that. So yeah, he's he's in the dark dimension. Uh, but once he opens the portal, evil beings begin to pour out. Luckily, Spider-Man isn't too far behind, and all three are able to keep the monsters at bay while the while portal closes the rift. Portal immediately leaves, and the others say their goodbyes. In a small epilogue, I just threw this in here because I thought it was you know it was interesting. In a small epilogue, Rick goes on a date with a recent tenant of his apartment complex only to be surrounded by a gang that she is apparently a part of. So just kind of throwing some Sleepwalker story in there. Sleepwalker's better half, other half, uh, Rick Sheridan, who is just trying to live his own life, is getting mixed up with, into some mm, very bad stuff. We'll just put it that way. I can't believe you skipped over Janine's introduction in the synopsis. Uh, right. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Memorable Jeez. moment for a 12-year-old boy. <laughs> She's got some short shorts on. I, I got to say, memorable, memorable moment for a 42-year-old man as well. <laughs> <laughs> it, it has a whole other tone when you put it like that. You know? <laughs> She's like maybe 20. <laughs> right. All right. So there we go. That brings our story to an end here, Portals of Power. This, you know, this wraps up this trilogy here where Spy Spider-Man, luckily he's saved from the dark dimension. We have Sleepwalker, who, even though he's been a jerk this whole time, he finally makes the right decision. And of course, Darkhawk, who uh, I, I would say that, uh, you know, his interaction with Sleepwalker probably left a pretty bad taste in his mouth. But at the end of the at the end of the day, he watches uh, Sleepwalker make the good decision. So, all right, we'll start with you, Chris. Tell me what you thought here, man. I want to emphasize before that i like this issue this comic and the crossover as a whole very cool but most of my notes are just complaints <laughs> oh great all right i like uh, i like hearing negative chris every once in a while let's hear it <laughs> <laughs> so uh as you mentioned earlier mike manley is on inks for for this it looks a lot different than most of brett blevin's sleepwalker art um and this is his last issue so maybe he was kind of in a rush or whatever as well it's most noticeable in the panels and stuff with with the uh, Brotherhood. There are some there there is still some really good art in this, but not up to sort of Blevins's uh, previous work on on this it, this title. And I wonder if maybe mainly doing the inks has something to do with that. Uh, Dar uh, we mentioned I mentioned last issue that Darkhawk's shoulder piece uh, was damaged, uh, and it's still consistent in this issue where they they keep it damaged, but. The problem is once Darkhawk changes and then changes back, that would have been repaired because he like his armor completely, you know, heals its, his body and armor completely heal itself every time he changes. So that's inconsistent with his with, you know, the Darkhawk powers and stuff. Uh, it could be because <laughs> Evil Hawk's getting closer and that's uh, okay. messing with the, the stuff. <laughs> it's it's affecting his return to forever is, a, is affecting Dark Ox powers, maybe. That's right. I'll be uh, uh, I'll be tweeting Marvel and asking for my no prize. <laughs> <laughs> Th them getting Darkhawk and Sleepwalker back in action is like done at light speed. Basically, it's all really right, dude. yeah. It's all rushed back together to get them into uh, into action again. And I kind of wanted like a real superhero fight from between Darkhawk and Sleepwalker. We never really got it. We got a little bit of a confrontation, and then. It was like Sleepwalker was like, well, I knew you'd take care of that. You took care of it, right? Yeah, well, okay, well, then we're good, right? Uh, so that was pretty much it. And again, like the art, it's it's kind of a shame that like a crossover that I was so excited about. And as a, and when I was a kid, I didn't really think of this art as being bad or anything. So uh, it didn't affect me then. But like, it's a shame that like a crossover that I loved so much kind of suffers from subpar art, especially when the artists that are working on it like are capable of much better, like because we've seen better from them you know in other issues but that's pretty much it i still like the book a lot and there's a lot of cool action in this one as well and like evan said earlier it's always uh, interesting to see like a mutant team going up against non-mutant superheroes and stuff it's kind of gives it a different flavor 
And I've got some other stuff I wanted to bring up about the letters page, but I'll do that after we're done with the rest of the uh, the issue. Okay. All right. So uh, about that dental plan, uh, <laughs> I I don't know. Doesn't gingivitis cause like the receding of your gums, or is that completely separate? I can't remember. But either way, there are the brotherhood is almost absent of gums in this uh, in this <laughs> issue. I mean, it's just like that is one of their mutant powers is to have teeth but no gums because that's I don't know if that can even be possible. But they're mutants. All teeth, no gum. <laughs> hey, Scary you can, looking. You can tell the brotherhood is used to having things going their way because you know what's the phrase? It's like pulling teeth to get something done. And they aren't <laughs> pulling any teeth. Oh no, they are not. Oh boy. I'll know. try that a few more times, and you can edit in the best take. <laughs> that didn't really work. I think there's something there, though. Uh, uh, I, I, I got to agree with you there, Chris, about the art. I mean, I don't know. Again, Evan, I think it's you weird put it because, best. like, I'm looking at the issue, like, the pages with Darkhawk and Sleepwalker fighting the mindless ones, which looks really good, but, like, most of the pages where they're fighting the Brotherhood just... It's kind of messy and it looks really rushed. I don't know. There's something weird going on. I don't, I don't know how to put my finger on it really. Right. Uh, the artist can draw circles around me. That's for sure. I mean, there's, <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not. You know, I'm not going to complain about uh, it. Just it. It does kind of look odd in some places. Rushed is probably the best way to put it in some way. And as far as story goes, I think you're right in the fact that. You know, we only do three issues. We it would have been nice to see something a little bit longer, especially with you know the animosity between Darkhawk mm. and Sleepwalker. I mean, you talk about light speed. He tra- he transforms into Darkhawk. Okay, Sleepwalker, you have a lot of explaining to do. And we get I don't know five or six panels, and then like oh well, let's try this two pages, <laughs> and then by the next page, they're it's team up time. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I would have I would have liked to have seen a little bit more uh, of a fight between them as well. I will say props to the letterer, which did that change? I think it did. Yeah. Our Bill Oakley's letter on Darkhawk and Sleepwalker's letterer is Rich, Rich S. They, Rich does, I mean, when you look at some of these, I believe I mentioned him in our, when we talked colorblindness as well, mm-hmm. uh, the way that these, the way that these panels, or excuse me, the, the word bubbles are, are made, uh, but um, specifically the, the lettering. One thing that stood out to me was when the blob was like hitting. I can't tell if that looks like Sleepwalker with a big eye beam. Yeah. And he's writing me immovable. And I mean, it looks completely different from the rest of the text. It makes it stand out. Props to him. So and anyway, as far as Portal goes, what a Mamby Pamby kind of guy. He's just like, <laughs> <laughs> he's just like, uh, you know what? I'm out of here. Oh, uh, you oh, know what? Man. I'm out of here. And then it, they're like, oh, OK, thanks for saving me. I'll grant you one wish. Dude, you could make portals. You could send Sleepwalker home. You could do this. You could do just about any. He was making portals all this time. It wasn't like there was some kind of a drawback if he made too many mm-hmm. portals or something like that. He could do it at will. And yeah. he's like, uh, you know what? OK, you want Spider-Man back? That's fine. But I'm not sending you home because, you know, you saved me. Oh, well, OK. All right, then. Um, Jesse, they have like 15 or 16 issues of Sleepwalker left. He can't send them home. <laughs> it's like a classic Gilligan's Island ending, you know? Hey, we've right. got to lay off the island. Oh, no, no. We have to come back next episode. No, nope. Portal's a jerk. He's just going to not do anything. Okay, all right. Evan Bevins, what are your notes, man? Well, uh, first of all, i got to give props to the uh, staff of the Daily Bugle's uh, morning edition or afternoon edition for, you know, cranking out a story that, in, in just a headline and subhead, tells Rick Sheridan everything he needs to know to get Sleepwalker back in the fight and advances the plot. So uh, kudos <laughs> to them. You know, I, you, you used to work on an afternoon paper with a morning deadline, and it uh, it, it takes some doing. So uh, <laughs> good good for the, good for those guys. I, I I like the detail when sleep when Rick figures out he needs Sleepwalker back. Oh, okay. Well, I uh, hope these relaxation techniques I've been practicing pay off. I, I don't know. That's just like one of those nice little uh, comic book details that. Maybe you go, wait, does that really? But it's like, you know what? Th- thanks for thinking about how this goofy story makes sense. I appreciate I, it. <laughs> I was, I started thinking to myself, I, 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 that clock was ticking in my head on when was Rick Sheridan asleep versus when he was awake. Because that probably writes these guys into a corner a lot of times, I would imagine. Like, I would think that they were like, oh man, it's, we got to make this, we got to make this happen at night. So it makes sense for Sleepwalker <laughs> to be out. And I was kind of paying attention to that as we were going along. But so I'm kind of glad that they acknowledged the fact like, oh, hey, you know, Rick's awake and he needs to get back to sleep in order for Sleepwalker to finish the rest of this story. 
which, you know, I'm, again, something I'm glad that they acknowledged, but uh, it did make me wonder sometimes throughout the issues, like, okay, is Rick, is Rick actually asleep? Is it daylight out? What's going on? Couldn't help but notice the uh, the sideways layout. You know, we've been talking a little bit about X Force influence. I, I did. I meant to look up where this uh, where this falls with the uh, the X Force Spider Man crossover that went like the two horizontal issues. Mm-hmm. It was really famous, and I, I'm not sure why that was. I mean, I thought it was neat too, but I, I don't I don't exactly know why. That would have been before this because by this time Image had launched, and those were. Liefeld and McFarlane. Yeah, uh, yeah. Liefeld and Mc... So that would have probably been nice. Plus, Fantasia didn't wasn't introduced till after that because I think that was like in what X Force three and four or something like that. Fantasia? Um, or, or no, you're talking about the, the, the Spider Man crossover with the right. horizontal pages. So Fantasia was introduced after that, I think. So yeah. So and then in in one of those horizontal sections, props to people who who deal with you know, turn out realistic dialogue, but there's something about like expository stilted comic book dialogue that I love with Sleepwalker. I will warp the air and create a wind funnel so we can proceed there without delay. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? That sounds completely plausible. I, you know, I, I And also for some reason, as I was looking at that, I, I kind of merged that in my mind with the Bernie Sanders meme. So I just imagine Sleepwalker saying, I am once again warping the air and creating a wind funnel. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe maybe there's something wrong with me, but that that that's that's where my head went. I liked in the fight with the Brotherhood, um, Sleepwalker finding a workaround for for Blob's power because you know it, it, it's not just that he's fat; it's that if he doesn't want to move, he can't he he doesn't move. So um, you know, there, there's there's an issue of uh, of the Hulk where the Brotherhood back when they were Freedom Force is taking on the Gray Hulk, and and the Hulk finds his own uh, workaround for the Blob's power. So uh. That's, that's just a, a, a nice bit of nostalgia. Again, when the blob was a threat and you had to, to come up with something uh, uh, with a way to deal with him as opposed mm-hmm. to just calling him fat. And Jesse, I, I did look up because I was curious, the sleepwalker sleeve thing. Yeah. Because I was also trying, I, I just looked it up. I was also trying to figure out because of, of the cliffhanger with, with Janine. I was trying to remember what happened with that. Okay, turns out in the early issues, Sleepwalker didn't have that, but he wears that sleeve because Janine is his ex-girlfriend, and he's got her name and face tattooed on his oh, bicep. Oh, come on. <laughs> I may have made Get that up. You did. Get out of here. Guess you'll have to Google it to find out. <laughs> or read Sleepwalker 18, which is an Infinity War crossover. <laughs> uh, do, do, you, do you remember, Chris? I think this is, with no research, but... I'm actually being honest. I think this is what happened that like Dr. Strange or somebody just mind controlled her to give Sleepwalker a message like, hey, we need you to do something. Yeah, I don't remember. (laughs) Okay, well, then we're going with the ex-girlfriend and the tattoo on the bicep. (laughs) Perfect. Oh, man. All right. Anything else there before we get into picking a panel? No, just uh, a lot of fun. I I, I enjoyed it. Um, you know, like I said, the, the, some of the things I, I joke about with the dialogue and everything, it, that's just part of what makes comics fun. Oh, yeah. Some of the dialogue's goofy, but if, if you do it right, uh, it, it still works. As far as, an, uh, you know, as far as my final thoughts on the thing, I mean, this, uh, you know, three-issue story, we have two characters that haven't crossed has before you know sleepwalker and darkhawk are finally coming together spider-man's going to be in on it too and you know as far as villains go throwing or you know tossing the brotherhood of evil mutants in here is probably in the early 90s these guys were probably hot hot tamales you know they were they were x-men villains Mm -hmm. uh so putting them up against these guys they weren't like unknown we knew who these we knew who these people were now as far as like understanding the specifics as to what their plan was like they were all they wanted first was to get this laser cannon which would apparently help them against the x-men or x-factor uh one of the you know, the rest of the the good hero mutants but you know it, everything falls out of just basically falls uh into chaos after that because oh crap we can't you know he takes us here okay we'll take us there oh no he doesn't do that either and it just seems like everything keeps going the wrong uh, which, for the villains. Which is kind of a nice change of pace. I mean, I know this doesn't happen all the time, but I, it, it seems like a lot of stories nowadays, it's like, you know, six parts, and by the time you get to part five, you realize that the hero and the villain both anticipated everything the other was doing, and uh, all, all this all this stuff's working like clockwork, and it's a conspiracy years in the making. And this was just like, hey, um, if we had these portals, 
we could attack the X-Men and, and get a laser cannon. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, crap, this isn't working. And these two new guys keep showing up and, and fouling <laughs> everything up for us. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, like the first thing that they thought was that the armor was the thing that controlled the portals. And then they realized, oh, no, it's actually this guy that does the portals. <laughs> oh, OK, well, let's get the guy. Uh, so they hypnotize the guy and then. Yeah, it just yeah, it doesn't it doesn't go well for these guys. And it's funny because it, not only do they fight with our heroes, they fight amongst themselves all the time too. Like they cannot get along. Uh, Sauron's yelling at the Blob, the Pyro's yelling at the Blob. It's it's just you know utter chaos a lot of times for these guys. Um, okay, well let's pick some panels. So Chris, I think it's your turn, right? You got you didn't get to go first yet, so you get to go first. All right. Well, uh, shouldn't be any surprise. I'm going to go with page 11, which is a full page shot of Dark Hawk and Sleepwalker bursting through a window or a sky skylight, something like that. Yeah, window. yeah dude, there's uh, I've used that as my cover photo on Facebook and Twitter several times. So <laughs> nice. Very with nice. That. Yeah, dude, that's like that's the piece of this trilogy. Uh, really, <laughs> you know, you, the crossover is finally happening. These fi guys are finally on the same side. They're finally going towards one goal, and that is to break through that window. And it <laughs> is fantastic. I want to aim higher. I want to be more mature. Spider-Man in the Dark Dimension is is definitely a thing. But um, I had forgotten about it. But when Janine arrives, I'm like, I remember that panel. That, <laughs> that's stu that's stuck in my mind. I mean, you know, I, what, what, yeah. what what can I say? I'm like. And I, I I I had forgotten about Janine, but uh, but but it, but it all came back to me. And I I don't I don't think she appears after issue eighteen, but I don't know. Just in terms of the panel that that had an impact on uh, on young me. I hear you, dude. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of give our listeners an idea of what we're seeing here. Like I said, short jean shorts. It looks like, and it must be hot in the city. We'll just put it that way because she's <laughs> she is wearing a bikini top. Yeah, Rick's sitting there uh, trying to work on something when she first appears and about falls on Rambo. Poor Rambo about meets his demise. But uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I mean, it's undeniably something that is memorable. So we'll put it that way. I'll take Chris, Chris transforming into Dark Hawk with its completely white back. Well, I'll say white oh, background yeah. with some with some uh, black circles, you know, as he apparently is radiating this dark force power or whatever. Uh, and he just looks like he is jacked and ready to go. Okay. <laughs> sleepwalker. You have a lot of explaining to do. That was a, that was really bad, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Blevins really gives uh dark Hawk the build. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he does. I mean, my God, definitely a, a buff, a buffer, bulkier dark Hawk. Got the musk. All right, we did it, guys. We have talked portals of power right here on the Unspoken Issues podcast. Sleepwalker and Darkhawk finally get together, and we talked about it. So, well, then I guess, uh, yeah, hey, you can check us out there in the future. We'll be talking Fantastic Four. The What, what was it called? The new Fantastic Four. The new Four. Fantastic Four, yeah. That's right. Now, so, are yeah. we doing the 90s? Or the new miniseries that's going right now. No, it'd be the '90s one. Okay. Yeah, I, I was I was pitching the '90s. I got the second issue of the miniseries today. Yeah, okay. Just wanted to make sure. Yep. I did want to do uh, something about the the letters page though. I think maybe we've talked about this before at some point, Jesse. Uncle Elvis, the guy who writes a lot of letters to Marvel in this yes. era. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, late '80s, early '90s, prolific letter writer. <laughs> um, and he's in a lot. I think he was. Uh, he, he's got a letter in the back of this Sleepwalker issue, and I think at least one if not both of the dark hawk issues that are part of this crossover and he is from dawson springs kentucky i vaguely remember seeing a lot of because i didn't read a lot of this uh, of the letters pages when i was kid i would read them sometimes sometimes i would just ignore them but i think it was on in some facebook groups or something over the last few years i've seen a lot of talk about you know uncle elvis whatever happened to him or whatever mm -hmm. and i noticed in an issue of something i was reading maybe thunderbolts or something like that over the last few months that his name he actually Instead of signing it Uncle Elvis, he signed it Elvis Orton, which was his real name. Oh. Uh, same address and everything. Uh, Dawson Springs, Kentucky is about 90 minutes from where I'm at. Um, my, one of my best friends grew up there. One of my delivery routes, I actually drive through Dawson Springs now. So I'm kind of familiar with it, with that area. So I thought it was, I just thought it was interesting because of that, really. So I tried, you know, in, in the social media age, <laughs> right. uh, it, it's not hard to stalk people online. So I tried to find... Uh, if he's still around, still living in Dawson Springs, and I found sadly an obituary for Johnny Elvis Orton of Dawson Springs, Kentucky, from 
August of 2020. So this guy was 82 when he passed, and he's got a son that's Elvis Orton Jr. So I don't know if it was Senior or Junior that was writing the letters. I kind of figure it was probably Senior. He would have been probably in his 40s, you know, in the early – or maybe – maybe see, he was born in 38. So in Wow, the, that would put the, him in the 90s. In the 80s and 90s, he would have been probably in his 50s. Um, yeah, fifties and sixties. So it may have been his son. I'm not. I'm not sure. His son does not have a Facebook page, so I couldn't. Uh, uh, I considered like reaching out if it was if he if he did to see. Hey, are you the one who wrote all the letters in Marvel Comics back then? But he, I couldn't find anything uh, with his son as far as any way to contact him on uh, social media. His son is 57, so maybe that was the one who was writing all the letters. Who knows? But I just that was just a rabbit trail that I, I started chasing a few. Uh, months ago and i was <laughs> gonna let you guys know about that but that's really interesting i any idea do you know like when he first started writing letters or started I, yeah i don't i don't really know um okay i'd love i'd love to have known because i mean i didn't re, you know i didn't read comics in the 80s i have some like trades and stuff from that of that material but i i don't really have a whole lot of back issues from that era so i don't know how far back he, he went i know that like a lot of Comic fans know who he is because of all the letters he wrote and stuff. So it, it, it's probably something that you could find, but I didn't actually look to see how long. That's some, that's some pretty solid research in there, Chris. So we got an opening at the paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love it. All around, we had a good time here. So let's go ahead. We will get into plugs. So Evan Bevins, you are a guy on Earth, and I'd love to hear what you do. Well, uh, I write about comics and movies and movies about comics, comics about movies and other stuff at uh, asterisk51.blogspot.com. Hopefully you can edit out that pause where I forgot the web address for a second. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But um, yeah, I'm uh, working my way through. I finally got into new territory on Secret Defenders, working my way through a storyline that kicks off with uh, Thunderstrike and War Machine and the Silver Surfer. You know, occasionally going through some of the uh, interesting uh, movie fu- movies I find at Dollar Tree. You can get some good deals. Uh, you can also find the Jurassic Games. Jurassic <laughs> Games that looked wonderful, by the way. I mean, yeah, I paid a buck twenty five for it. I, I don't, I don't feel like I totally wasted my money. Um, That's good. That's good. It, uh, it had some things in it. Um, and <laughs> some things uh, happened. Yeah, I'm. Pretty sure that was where the uh, the kids from Dinosaur Train um, went to kind of shed their squeaky clean image. Um, I don't know. If you have kids who watch Dinosaur Train, that might be vaguely funny. Um, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about, actually. But okay. well, it's a PBS kids show. You know, think think the the Disney Channel actors and actresses that, you know, like go off and play oh, a stripper gotcha. or a, you know, prostitute or, um, you know, a drug addict or, or whatever. It'd be like, yeah, see, we're, we don't just do kids shows. So, um it was hilarious in my head when I was watching Jurassic games at midnight. <laughs> anyway, so if you like that joke, there's more where that came from at asterisk51.blogspot.com. Very good. All right, Chris Armstrong, what's going on, man? What the hell's all about it? <laughs> uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at BrodyMan34. I have a movie podcast where my buddy AJ and I discuss uh, direct video and made for TV movies called Small Screeners. You can follow uh, the Small Screeners accounts on on Twitter and Instagram at Small Screeners. Uh, and we're going to have a guest for the first time uh, on our next episode, that being our buddy Jesse Starcher. Hey, all right. Yeah, I, it was funny because, uh, you know, you invited me on one and I was like, dang it, I wish I, I could make it, but I'm not going to. And by golly, you guys are going to be doing Tremors 2 next. I'd love to get on that. Maybe you can maybe maybe we can work something out and you're like oh yeah we're doing it this saturday all right well hey ladies and gentlemen go back into the archives uh on the source material comics podcast feed you can find all sorts of earlier ish uh, earlier episodes of the unspoken issues podcast and of course my own podcast that i do on uh which is called source material it's i think recently we dropped our discussion on teenage mutant ninja turtles the Last Ronin, which was a uh, fun, uh, well, it wasn't a fun book to read. It was really sad. <laughs> it was really sad, but it was a great story nonetheless. And I got to sit down and talk with Alexis Hanna and uh, Benjamin J. Cologne about that. Uh, prior to that was my little solo episode on Fugitoid. So 
if you want to learn who Fugitoid is, I did too. And I did a little solo podcast educating the masses, I guess you'd say. So if you want to check that out, you can hear me experience Fugitoid number one, which was an uh, interesting comic, one of Peter uh, Laird, uh, Eastman and Laird's earlier, very early ventures uh, into comics. So it was, uh, it was a great time all around. Unspoken Issues. My goodness, like I said, I, I, before this one airs, super, uh, Soviet super soldiers should, should hit, say that five times fast, should hit the airwaves. And then uh, Ghost Rider 2099. Oh, my goodness. I had no idea what I was getting into there. Boy, you, <laughs> you wouldn't believe how many times I've, I think I mentioned this in the podcast, but I snubbed my nose at a 2099 comic. And then we read Ghost Rider 2099, and I was actually really, really impressed with what we got in there. Very like, hey, oh, yeah, this is the Marvel history, but don't worry, we're not going to be paying too much attention to it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, all right, fair enough. Uh, so it was a good written story. So that should be in the archive as well. Uh, with that being said, thanks uh, to the W2M Network uh, for hosting the podcast. And, of course, thanks to my good buddies here, Evan Bevins and Chris Armstrong. I'm Jesse Starcher. We'll talk to you soon. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. Unspoken Issues is part of the UnspokenDecade.com, the home for 90s comics, blogs, and podcasts. Unspoken Issues also has a Facebook group you can join if you are interested. Just search the Unspoken Issues podcast and request to join. All of this would not be possible without W2Mnet.com and the Rattelich and Broadcasting Network, so make sure to seek them out for more podcasts. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please feel free to share, and we look forward to entertaining you again soon. (laughs) 